The second chapter of Lumen Fidei is entitled, Unless You Believe, You Will Not Understand. Immediately, this title is going to be somewhat provocative and confrontational, especially to people who don't have faith, to people who are atheists, perhaps, or even of another faith tradition. They'll say, this is the problem with your faith, is you use circular logic to defend it. You say, unless you believe, you won't understand, and since we don't believe, we can't understand, and then you, therefore you can just dismiss us. See, I think that's an important objection and one that we need to handle. And so I'm going to handle that at the end of this video. But at first, I want to talk about this chapter and kind of go through it the way Pope Francis does. The Pope begins this chapter speaking of King Ahaz and Isaiah. This comes from the 7th through 9th chapters of Isaiah in the Old Testament. And King Ahaz finds himself in a situation where his enemies are moving in on him from every direction. And he's looking, how am I going to be saved? And so he thinks, I'll form an alliance with the Assyrian Empire. That's what I will do. They've got a strong army. They can help protect me. They can help save me. God right away sends Isaiah out to the king to say, it's not the Assyrian Empire that you need to have faith in. It's the God of Israel, the God who is firmly established the world in his wisdom, who has a plan for it, the God who governs all times and all places and all ages. This is the God you need to have faith in, and you will not be destroyed. In chapter 7, verse 9 of the book of the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah says to King Ahaz, Unless you believe, you will not understand. That's the Greek rendering of that text. The original Hebrew is something to the effect of, If you will not believe, you will not be established. The New American Bible says, your, if your, Unless your faith is firm, you shall not be firm. Now see, all three of these are talking about the need for a firmness in faith in order for Ahaz to be saved, in order for Jerusalem to be saved here. Now, what the Pope says is that faith without truth doesn't save. So this firmness of this faith needs to come from truth. It needs to come from something that is real. He says, faith without truth doesn't save. It remains a projection of our happiness, capable of providing us some satisfaction so long as we're willing to deceive ourselves. You see, doesn't this sound exactly like the objection that many atheists have to our faith? They say, well, it's nice in that it makes you happy, but you're deceiving yourself, believing in this God. The other thing the Pope says is faith without truth, the other option is it will become reduced to this lofty sentimentality where it might satisfy us, it might bring us some cheer in a particular moment, but it will prove in the long run incapable of sustaining us. Think about the way in which we might encounter somebody who has an experience of God and is on fire with faith for a little while. Then you see that same person two years later, you find out they're not going to church, they're really not into the faith anymore, they've kind of given up on all of that. They didn't have the roots. Their faith wasn't rooted in truth. It was rooted in this emotional experience, and therefore it didn't sustain them. But he says, faith that's rooted in truth will be sustaining. Faith and truth go together, he notes. He says, faith and science also go together. And so he says, faith without truth proves useless, but so does science without faith, he said. He said, science without faith will give us this formulaic understanding of nature. We can certainly understand the laws of physics. But he said, when we think about nature, we seem to think about it more than just laws of physics and chemistry. There seems to be something beyond that when we think about nature. And then we can only understand those realities through faith. Think, for example, of a concerto or a symphony, or if you must, a rock concert. You could go to a rock concert or symphony, and you can hear beautiful music, and people like to go and hear these things live. Yet here's the thing. With our technology today, we can record these great works of art and play them back if you get the right equipment and hear the identical sounds. Yet there's something that doesn't quite match that experience of being live and in person, listening to that music being played live. Even though the auditorial vibes are the same, the sound waves are identical, there's something about being in that presence that moves beyond what our science can give us. That's what we're talking about here. Or again, we can think, going back to that music example, of the way in which we can write about music. We can record music in writing. In other words, you know, you've got your you know, staffs with all your notes written down on it. Yet, hearing that music is a completely different experience than just seeing the formula of it. That's what the Pope is talking about when he says that faith allows science to go beyond itself. It allows us to see a bigger picture of reality.
Now, faith begins with hearing. This is something very basic in scripture. We see it in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, that faith begins with hearing. Think back to Abraham, whose faith began when he heard the word of God. Or we can think of the prologue to John's gospel, where the word becomes flesh. Now, here's the interesting thing about a faith that begins with hearing, or hearing in, in general. Hearing always calls us into relationship with a subject, because hearing posits that there's someone doing the speaking, and we're called into relationship with that person, and we do so over time. It takes time for audio vibes to hit us and be processed, and it also demands a response on our part as well. So think of a conversation. It's not just spent, meant to be one-sided, as is this YouTube video, I know, <laughs> but it's not meant to be one-sided but it demands a response. That's why there's comment fields in YouTube, for example. But it demands a response on our part. Now, when we posit God, what we're positing is the ultimate subject. See, God is not an object. So often science wants to treat God as an object, and we want to perform experiments to prove that God exists. But God's not an object. He's a subject, and he speaks to us. And in doing so, he calls us into relationship with him. So we're called into relationship with him, and that relationship demands a response. That response on our part is our faith, our faith in this God. Now, when we think about God, and we're called into relationship with him, what this does is because God is the source of all reality, God, when he looks out on reality, sees everything as it truly is. When we're called into relationship, our sense of sight is also illumined. So it's not just our hearing, but our sight as well that's illumined. And we can see things as they truly are. In the Hellenistic culture, they used sight as the way of depicting and understanding truth as it truly is. So they would use hearing to say, well, I'm beginning to understand something, but light shed its foley on something, allows it to be clearly seen, and so there's no question about it. See, that's what faith does for us, is faith, when it's grounded in truth, allows us to see reality. It allows us to see things as they truly are, to see through the eyes of God, so to speak. And therefore, we begin to open up a broader horizon than science alone can open up. Now, faith, of course, does begin with believing. We have to first posit God, and we have to believe in him in order to understand and see things through his own eyes. It doesn't work the other way around. It would be senseless to say, I'm going to try to see things through God's eyes, even though I don't believe that God really exists. It can't be done. You have to say, I see God exists, or I believe he exists, and now I'm going to try to see things through his eyes. Now, this might sound crazy, but I'm going to go back to that first objection that I talked about, where unless you believe, you will not understand. This isn't a statement that's just made of faith. This is true of science as well. Science says, unless you believe, you won't understand. See, there's certain things that you have to just believe in order to get science off the ground. For one, you have to believe the world is intelligible. If you're not willing to believe or posit an intelligible world, science makes no sense whatsoever, because you're saying that I don't believe the world's intelligible, yet I'm going to try to figure it out. It makes no sense. Similarly, science makes us um, posit that the future will resemble the past. So whenever we perform an experiment and can show that it can be repeated and repeated, we posit that it will be able to be repeated in the future as well. So we don't question whether or not gravity, for example, is going to work tomorrow. We say, we, pot, we take that as a given, that if it's been shown to work continuously in the past, it will continuously work in the future as well. Yet there's no proof of that. It's just a hope or it's just a belief that we have that tomorrow when we wake up, gravity will still apply. So it does begin with belief, just as faith begins with belief. Both science and faith begin with belief. That doesn't invalidate either as a form of knowledge, though. The other thing that's important to understand is they're not in opposition to each other. You know, like Pope Francis said, faith needs truth. It shouldn't just be this sentimental whim. To the extent that it is, it could actually be quite dangerous. So we need to say that faith is grounded in truth. It's grounded in a God who is true, a God who has created reality, and a God who will remain faithful to his promises. If you're not going to posit that, whatever it is you're positing is not faith anymore. It ceases to be faith and maybe becomes superstition or something like that. Pope Francis, when he speaks about faith and the need to begin with faith, I think he uses a nice example from scripture. And so I want to share that with you. He uses the story of the woman who had the hemorrhage, who was bleeding, and Christ is walking through this crowd. And people are pushing up against him, and she says, if I just touch his cloak, I'll be healed. And so she reaches out and touches his cloak. What happens? Christ immediately turns and says, who touched me? Because he feels the power go out of him. And his disciples look at him as if he's crazy. I mean, 
who touched you? You're in the middle of this giant crowd and you want to know who touched you? Um, but here's the point of this. A lot of people were touching Christ, as the apostles correctly noted, the disciples noted that. But only one was cured. It was the one who had faith. The one who started with that position of faith was cured. She came to that light and was restored to fullness of her being, full wellness of her being. That's what happens with faith. We have to start with a belief. And when we believe, we can reach out to God and then we can be healed. If we don't believe, we could be bumping up against him all we want and we're never going to come to this understanding of greater truth. We're never going to see the potential that's there before us to be healed. See, I think that's a great example of what we're talking about when we talk about faith. The final thing that the Pope ends this chapter on is he talks about theology. Now, theology is the science of faith. St. Anselm described theology as faith seeking understanding. So now that we have this faith, we go and we seek to understand the world. It's interesting to note that theology can only be done by a person of faith. You can do religious studies, certainly, um, without faith. But theology demands that you have faith because it starts with your faith and it seeks to now understand the world. The Pope notes that theology, though, cannot be done apart from the magisterium of the church. And he says, here's the reason why. The church is so intimately linked with God. It is the body of Christ. And therefore, if we want to see with the eyes of God, we need to be connected to the body of Christ. And we do that by being in union with the Bishop of Rome and all the bishops. The Holy Spirit has safeguarded the hierarchical church from error on faith and morals. Not from error on practical judgments or decisions. It doesn't mean that they always do the right thing or that they make moral choices in their lives. But when teaching on these things, they are teaching what is true. That's what we're safeguarded from by the Holy Spirit, is from the error of teaching a false teaching. So when we connect ourselves to the body of Christ, and we do that by being in union with the Bishop of Rome and the other bishops, when we connect ourselves to this body of Christ, we're able to see reality as it truly is. When we disconnect ourselves, when we disassociate from the bishops and begin to view them as the enemy or the ones who are preventing us from knowing the truth, what happens is a type of haze covers our vision, and we're no longer able to see things clearly. Our sense of hearing becomes muffled and, and muted, and we're not able to hear clearly this call from God. But as long as we remain in union with them, we unite ourselves with God. And to the extent that we do that, we're able to see things as they really are, to see reality as God sees it.